Uh, my name is Sean Spears. I'm director of Green Alliance, and I'm very pleased to welcome you to our latest event where we're going to be discussing uh, the environment and its place in UK China diplomacy. We've got three great panelists uh, with us this afternoon. Bernice Lee is founding director of the Hoffman Centre for Sustainable Resource Economy at Chatham House. Isabel Hilton is the founder of China Dialogue, and Stephen Kinnock is the shadow minister for Asia and the Pacific. And we're going to uh, have a panel discussion for about 40 minutes and then Sam Alvis, Green, Green Alliance's Head of Green Renewal, is going to field some of the uh, questions from you. So if you'd like to ask a question, please put it in the Q, use the Q&A function uh, for that. And you can also upload your favourite question from other people uh, and that makes uh, it more likely that it will be asked. You can also use the chat function uh, to as it were, talk among yourselves, but we won't be monitoring that uh, during the, the event. Um, finally, on the sort of housekeeping, if you'd like to tweet during the event, please do so using the hashtag, uh, hashtag GA event. So um, without further ado, I'd like to get on with the, the panel discussion and uh, Bernice asked the first question of you. Um, which is to, to ask what are the latest indications from China on its ambitions to help tackle the climate and nature crises? Well, thank you very much, Sean, and really glad to be here today. As we all know, not so long ago, that is about earlier this month in early March, we have the international environment community have our waiting for Godot moment as we were waiting for the announcements from China, which actually was started by the Premier at the time, Li Keqiang, on the 5th of March, on outlining some of the aspects of what is known as the 14th five-year plan on national economic and social development in a speech in the annual session of China's National People's Congress. As we all know by now, these unveiling of these plans are very significant global events, not least because the size of China has meant that these kind of uh, economic plan can make or break the global green, I call it the green domino effect trajectories. And also it is a particularly important waiting for Godot moment, which actually didn't really come in some ways, partly because of the surprise that President Xi Jinping made a year ago during the UN General Assembly in September 2020, when it announced China's carbon neutrality by 2060 and peaking by early 30, 2030 commitments. Now, even though right, even right now, energy and climate geeks are still pouring over some of the fine prints, it, the expectation is that the fine prints or the, the headline targets are not really expected to change in the very short term. Now, what we would like to highlight here are a couple of, let's say, simple numbers. One of them is China is a large emitter. It is about responsible for about a quarter of global emissions. And so it is important to know that these five-year plans will indeed shape its emissions trajectory in the next five years and beyond. And according to experts from Tsinghua University and others, they have suggested that for China to stay on track to reach peaking, the highest carbon emissions before 2030 and achieve carbon neutrality by 2060, and assuming a GDP growth rate of about 5.3% in the next five years, China will need to reduce its energy intensity by about 14% and carbon intensity by about 19 to 20%. Now, even though the figures that were made public a month ago were not that far off, they have come without an overall economic growth target in the five-year term, which means that it is actually making it harder right now to gauge the actual ambition level, as well as the planned emissions reduction level within this period. And many of the environmental colleagues in China have called for uh, emissions cap, especially carbon emissions cap, alongside the energy efficiency targets in the 14th five-year plan. So in sum, between 21 to 2025, China has announced that it will lower energy intensity by 13.5%, lower carbon intensity by 18, increase non-fossil energy's share in the energy mix from 15.8 to about 20% in 2025, increase forest cover to you know just over 24%. Now, even though China is known for liking to undercommit and overdeliver when it comes to domestic goals and targets, it is still disappointing that China has not backed up President Xi's announcements last year with more decisive signals and more detailed nearer term plans. 
So I think that there are a couple of things that is worth noting. First of all, is that this is set against a context of having actually quite a large passage in this domestic economic plan about a more hostile economic environment globally around protectionism and obviously less opportunities around external trade, etc. It is also part of the continuation of what has started for a couple of five year plans that China will continue and accelerate a structural economic shift away from an export led growth model towards a more consumption based model. Now, this is going to be feared by a middle class, which is going to estimated in 2018 to be about 400 million and growing, 400 million people and growing. And then, of course, as always, all the numbers coming from China is staggering. And a lot of this lifting, by the look of it, will have to be done in Chinese China cities. So in the five year plan, which also identify another large transition, in addition to what I just mentioned in terms of the export growth model moving towards domestic consumption is also the whole movement towards urbanization that some something like 65% of its population would be expected to live in urban clusters by 2025 and by 2050 a billion people will be in Chinese cities responsible for 75% three quarters of emissions. This also points to huge opportunities, but also major challenges when it comes to an Asian environment. Maybe one other point I want to raise before we move to sort of more broader question about UK China diplomacy, which is that this is not just an internal play, which is also very important because it looks like the President Xi and also now Premier Li Keqiang have in some ways pecked its domestic credibility towards delivering greener growth at home, but also this international reputation as well, since the announcements that were made in the UN General Assembly, as well as Davos as well earlier this year, were tying obviously China's international reputation as well to stronger climate action and commitments as well. This means that there will be much more to play in the coming months this year and also next year, as, as was mentioned, I think in the promotional material, obviously because of COP26, but also of China's hosting of COP15 as well on biodiversity. A lot of commentators have expressed, I think, expected really disappointment in the way China has continued to go for coal-related development, even though in private and also in public, the signal is that it is actually going down a little bit. And whether or not China has, in fact, while it has chosen the cleaner growth path, has not really chosen enough to retire its brown economy. And I think that the challenge here is that the two things are tied, that embarking on a, on a path towards greener growth is a way out of the brown economy. But in the current climate, it does feel that no one is currently putting all the cards in one particular basket at this point. I'm mixing the metaphor, sorry about that. So we definitely need to see more later in the year. The check is in the post, the waiting for Godot is continuing in some ways, partly because there are expectations that there'll be more sectoral plans and power sector plans, particularly, and also climate plan coming out of the Ministry of Environment and Ecology later this year, that will be giving us more detail. Now, having said all of this, so far, I would say the signaling is not terrible at all. Just a couple of weeks ago, for example, I think the president uh, actually in the ninth session of the Central Financial and Economic Affairs Commission, which is an important economic planning commission within the China senior leadership, uh, they continue to signal the importance of carbon peaking and carbon neutrality as a comprehensive and deep part of China's economic and social reform survey that I just saw done by I think the Europeans actually in China again are mentioning that in terms of rolling out of the carbon markets in China the to China equivalent of the ETS emissions trading scheme is suggesting that after these announcements by the president last year there is signs that these are moving ahead and faster than before so the good news I think here is that the what is not in question even though the how fast is still the question and so the question then is how much faster can we all be moving towards much closer to carbon neutrality for all of us and also not certainly not just in China, but also using that dominant effect that China's announcements had already created. Now it's not just China, of course, I mean, I think the UK is also one of the leaders when it comes to transitioning out of coal. The rumor that both South Africa and India are going to come up with a carbon neutrality plan is definitely testimony to 
definitely China's announcement, but also leadership by, for example, the UK and Canada and as on the powering past coal alliance as well, that could make it possible. So I can definitely see that there could be synergistic positive impact that these sort of these sort of more ambitious announcements could bring not just within domestic units, but also internationally, that we should be investing more time into creating this positive sum dynamics around the world. Thank you. Great, thanks, Monique. And I'll just follow up briefly on, I mean, how, how much of this action is coming, as it were, from international pressure uh, and trying to emulate other countries internationally, and how much of it is sort of purely domestically born? Well, I mean, I would like to think that this is where both the domestic imperative and the external pressure can work together. The domestic pressure comes from a combination of the growing middle class who wants clean air, clean water as much as anyone else who is middle class anywhere else in the world. And that obviously the pollution in Chinese city hurts the citizens more than anyone else to start with, and therefore there is a domestic imperative. Having said this, there is no question that given that climate and clean energy is one of the areas where China is in fact doing well by the world standards in some ways, so certainly from the perspective of all the other issues that it is under pressure at the moment, there is definitely a sense that the citizens also enjoy talking to friends in China who travel the world like all of us do, or we used to at least, they are certainly proud of the fact that the country is not a laggard in areas around clean energy compared to many other issues it is cons as considered to be. Now, before Xi Jinping's announcements last year, it was widely reported and perhaps with some justification that strong pressure from the European Union certainly had played a role in helping to speed up that announcement. So I think that as always, no one can be sure, who knows, because that announcement, what we do know is that it was kept very close to the top and very few people knew about it. So therefore, whatever the decision was, was definitely coming out of strong political calculation from the top. One can only assume that as no man, including China, is an island, that international pressure can play a role in helping shape some of these emissions trajectory as to how much it can take us all the way through to the 1.5 degree is a different question. But I think that it does mean that we have to keep trying to put international pressure on each other when it comes to more ambitious climate action. Thank you. Thanks, Bernie. So, so Isabel, if I can if I can turn to you, we, we're having quite a lively debate in this country about how the UK should approach relations with, with China um, and and the balance there between environmental action and human rights concern, etc. Uh, I wonder if you could just put that in, into the context of how other countries are, are dealing with these issues. Uh, Sean, thank you. And uh, like Bernice, delighted to be here. Um, Bernice has raised a lot of very important questions about the roots of China's climate policy, uh, which, I, which I think are important to understand. I, we shared the widespread disappointment at the 14 five-year plan, but if we're looking at China's climate policy, I think it's essential to understand one, maybe two things. One, the, the leadership understands China's vulnerability to climate change completely. And two, they also see the economic uh, promise of being leaders in renewable technologies. For that, they need a carbon constrained world. So although we can complain about the speed of China's uh, action on particularly on domestic or on BRI climate um, policies, I have never felt really since, well, maybe for the last decade, their commitment seems to me to be a matter of self-interest and therefore unlikely to waver in the way that uh, the United States is vulnerable to changes in, in political leadership. So to your question, um, everyone is grappling with this central issue of how you deal with a, a rising, a risen China. How do you deal with this world's second largest economy, the world's biggest emitter, which also seems to um, have different norms and standards, shall we say, on questions of, of human rights and on questions of the global order. Um, so there are big issues and like, uh, like the British in their recent integrated review and the Americans and the European Union, all have come to the conclusion, the Western democracies have come to the conclusion that China is both um, a necessary partner, but also a strategic rival and balancing that is going to be a very long-term question. 
for for Britain, I mean, this question is further complicated by Britain's need to find itself a role in the world or a position in the world post Brexit. And that is something that for me, at least the integrated review didn't really answer. It laid out a lot of aspirations. It invoked a lot of past glories. Um, it talked about the need for a closer integration across government, of foreign and, and domestic and industrial policy. And that's all fine. It was remarkably silent on Britain's future relationship with the EU. And if you look at, at the climate context right now, there are three important blocks which account for most of the world's emissions. And they are the United States, uh, which has 15% of global emissions, China, which has 28% of global emissions, and the European Union, which has 17% of global emissions. And that's a triangle that is, you know, clearly the most important triangle in, uh, in mitigation and in the battle to address climate change. The complexity of relations between these three blocks um, is, is just a constantly shifting landscape. So the United States is back in the game, the Trump administration to nobody's regret um, in the climate business is gone. And everyone's licking their wounds, trying to pick up the pieces. Biden has committed firmly to climate and John Kerry has a cabinet post. He's highly active. He's been he's experienced because he was he, you know, he's been around since um, certainly in 2015. Um, and and he's a key player with a good relationship with Xi Jinhua, who's a key figure in climate negotiations in China. And in many ways, this is the prime relationship. The UK China, uh, sorry, the US China relationship is the, is the most important because it's both the most volatile in geopolitical um, terms, and because each side sees the other as as its prime threat, if you like. Um, and also, China constantly measures itself against the United States. So the China believes that the United States is out to stop its rise, um, partially true, but also a useful narrative at home. Then the US believes China has become a rogue actor in many ways, unfair trade practices, undermining global order, et cetera, et cetera. So where does climate sit? Well, there was that key moment in um, two years before the Paris Agreement when Obama and Xi Jinping agreed to work jointly towards an agreement in Paris. And that change the dynamic of the run-up to Paris in very important ways. So either side, the, the, the US or China, can scupper progress in climate talks. But if they work together, they can ensure that the thing stays on track. And that was extremely important in ensuring success in Paris. So the, the difficulty that Biden has is he is both committed to climate action, but also very boxed in in terms of China policy. He has very little room for maneuver. This is a bipartisan policy. We can see from Alaska that things remain difficult. But within that rather bleak landscape, um, climate is about the only good story. And I personally think it's really important, as John Kerry has proposed, that climate not be dragged in to the disputes over you know, the whole range of possible disputes and real disputes that the US has with China. It's too important both to China and the United States, but also to the rest of the world to be held hostage to those issues. If you look at the European Union, it's in a rather more steady state in that it is, you know, has a firm commitment to climate policy. It's very forward position. Its, green, its recovery plan is, is amongst the greenest in, in the world. What China worries about with the European Union is that it will form a kind of alliance with the United States and China has exerted a lot of diplomatic uh, effort to ensuring that doesn't happen, to try to maintain um, or try to support the Europeans desire for strategic autonomy, um, but also from the Chinese perspective to stop a too close an alliance forming. Um, it's a steady actor. It, there is the trade and investment deal, which was signed um, but not but has a long way to go with China last year in the closing moments of the German um, presidency that is going to have a difficult passage in the European Parliament and um, again some effort is going to have to be expended to stop that spilling over into uh, the climate cooperation the EU has climate cooperation arrangements with China and, with, and there is a lot of discussion at the present over its climate cooperation arrangements with the US.
So where does the UK fit in this? Well, as I said, um, the how that the UK obviously has an important role this year because of G7 and because of COP, um, the, the COP in, in, in Glasgow. After this year, I, I think quite honestly, the UK is going to be too preoccupied with trying to uh, recover from the twin blows of Brexit and, and, and the pandemic. And unless it puts its relationship with the EU back on track, it's going to find it difficult to exert influence beyond that of um, a historically um, slightly shrunken power with some residual importance, being a P5 member and so on, but diminishing weight in the world. So unless it can form the kind of relationships which allow it to magnify its effect, to substitute somehow for its position within the European Union, I think it's going to be difficult for the for the UK as such um, to to matter. And as host of COP26, I think it has been quite important um, that the UK has a credible position itself on climate change. And while historically that's been true, I think you only need to read, you know, things like the report today from the energy on the energy efficiency of existing homes from the Environmental Audit Committee to see that for this government, at least, climate change is not yet and the kind of integrated across government policy uh, that it needs to be. So if I have a wish for UK climate policy going forward, it's probably slightly less in the international sphere where I think you know, it's going to be difficult. And I think it should concentrate on having a better story uh, to tell at home. So things to watch in this triangular relationship, um, carbon border tax adjustments are going to be a big one. Uh, we expect an announcement or at least a, um, a, conclu a conclusive policy by July. That needs to be well managed or it's going to cause really quite difficult relationships with both China and the United States. And, um, and again, I would, I would simply emphasize that China is deeply committed to climate change. We can argue with the speed, we can, there are lots of things we can argue about, but we shouldn't allow China to hold climate change hostage in order to ensure um, that it doesn't come under criticism over its human rights policy or any other geostrategic issue. It really needs to be carved out. It's difficult to do, but I think it's essential. So I'm going to stop there and uh, look forward to the conversation. Thank you. Thanks as well. If I just follow up on one, on one thing, not so much on the climate diplomacy, but, but it, interestingly in the integrated review, the, the prime minister's introduction said that the that tackling climate change and biodiversity loss uh, is its number one, the government's number one international priority. Is there is there a particular role for UK diplomacy on the biodiversity side, which has often been the poor relation to, to, to climate? Well, yes, again, I, I, I would hope so. But um, as you know, there has been uh, increasing awareness that it, it really doesn't make a lot of sense to separate the biodiversity crisis and the climate crisis, that they are mutually reinforcing as crises and can be mutually reinforcing as solutions. But there is an enormous disparity in the processes. So the biodiversity process is very much the poor relation to the climate process. And, the, and COP15 really reflects that. It, so far, it seems very low on ambition. Uh, it's very unclear whether it's going to come up with anything convincing post Aichi targets, all of which have been missed. Um, it's a more complicated process to be fair. It's, it's not like climate where, you know, if you like, you can, you can, you know, the sciences can be focused on the question of emissions. Um, so it is, it is rather more complicated, but it would seem to me that, that the, the British you know, given that these two important processes happen in the same year, um, that offering at least diplomatic support to COP15, you know, could could make some difference. We have we have an unambitious presidency. The secretariat, again, you know, doesn't seem to be very proactive. So at the moment, it's it's drifting towards a rather pro forma. Uh, uh, meeting in which the Chinese who are hosting regard themselves as facilitators and not as a proactive, you know, lead, leadership um, 
uh, question. It's the first time that they have hosted anything like this, and it's a complicated one to host. But they're not putting anything on the line here. And I think that, you know, Britain, if it, if it still has convening power, should be convening diplomatic so support around COP15 in order to you know, try to get it um, over at least some kind of line. So I, I, I'm, I don't really have the impression that that is happening very, um, very convincingly, but it would be a good thing. This is well, it's a little depressing to hear, but we may come back to that. Um, Stephen, I'll turn to you in a moment, but... <laughs> Uh, Stephen, I'll turn to you in a moment, but, but Bernice, you just wanted to make a quick point on, on that, I think. Yeah, I do. I just want to sort of throw things into the mix a little bit, if I may, on the biodiversity COP in terms of UK and China. I think there's one area which is both about biodiversity and climate is, of course, about deforestation free supply chains, which is an area that even I was on the Global Resource uh, Initiative Task Force in the UK and that the recommended the recommendation that ultimately wasn't taken up necessarily. But I think that picking that back up, due diligence, deforestation free supply chain would be an area of win-win. And the same would apply also to sustainable agriculture as well, given that this five-year plan that China just announced also has reducing, obviously, food in, in, in import dependence on energy and food in it, and therefore sustainable agriculture being also an area that connect both the biodiversity piece as well as the climate piece. And the last thing I want to mention is money, even though we haven't seen much in terms of what China intended to help facilitate or not when it comes to finance package around biodiversity. What we do know is that in this year of post-COVID recovery, when money is short, we want money to go a long way. That means that every single public finance package, whether it's biodiversity or climate, we need to do a lot of things. So working together globally, not, not necessarily just in terms of UK, China, but globally around making sure that these money go a long way in delivering all these multiple goals is going to be one of the major asks for this year going into the future as well. Thank you. Thanks, Bernice. So if I, if I can turn you to you, Stephen, uh, uh, you heard Isabel say, let's not drag uh, climate into other disputes. Do you, do you think we can keep the environmental diplomacy separate from um, other concerns and, and you know how, how can the UK government um, navigate these challenging issues? Well thank you very much Sean and, and many thanks to the Green Alliance for this opportunity and it's a real honour to follow Bernice and, and Isabel who've spoken so um, eloquently about the, the, the challenges uh, and I agree basically with everything that they've said. Um, I think that you hit the nail on the head there in your question in terms of the how, because I think there's a broad um, consensus around the fact that we need constructive engagement with China on this issue of uh, tackling climate change and, and biodiversity. Uh, the big question mark then is, is how, and, and that really boils down to a question of how do you define what is effective and successful diplomacy? What is an effective and successful diplomat good at doing? Um, and that, of course, re relates to the political level of the relationship as well. And I, I, for me, I think it boils down to two things. One is around creating the right mood music for a dialogue to happen. And then for that dialogue to produce win-wins. And those two um, objectives, are, of, of course, absolutely interconnected uh, and I think the the big question then is with a with a vast power like China how do you create the right mood, mood music and I and, and my colleagues on the front bench Lisa and Andy and others are firmly of the view that in order to create the right kind of mood music you need to do that through being robust not through being uh, accommodating in a way that actually runs counter to your basic values and principles. Because if you are robust, you can begin to create an atmosphere of mutual respect. And mutual respect is much more fertile ground for creating those win-wins and building that dialogue that we're looking for than um, a, an atmosphere which is based on accusations of hypocrisy, of one side not respecting or not taking the other seriously. Uh, and that creates precisely the sort of mood music which leads to an antagonistic 
relationship and one which is, is not going to be productive. So uh, the, the, this idea that if you're robust in areas of human rights, for example, that will somehow contaminate the conversation when it comes to uh, areas where you need to cooperate, for example, what we're talking about today, uh, I think that's completely wrong. Uh, I, I think that the, the, the Chinese Communist Party and the people you know, running China, they respect unity and consistency and strength, and they are contemptuous of weakness and division. Uh, and so that has to be, I think, the guiding principle for British diplomacy in all areas of its uh, engagement with China. And that can be then broken down. So if you break that down a little bit into where are the areas that we need to compete, where we need to challenge and where we need to cooperate. Uh, and I make no apology for the fact that all three of those words begin with a C, because that I hope will help us to remember them and, and perhaps to create the framework that we need. And it's clear that in the area of competition, we, we need to be much better at building our own technology base, at working uh, in a transatlantic way with the US and the EU to create that much deeper investment into R&D. We need to be able to reduce our dependence on China. 57 of our critical national infrastructure supply chains in the UK are dependent uh, on China. Uh, and I think that that better and more robust competition will start to build a bit more mutual respect between the two sides. We need to challenge. Uh, it, there is no doubt that what's happening in Xinjiang is a scar on the conscience of the world and it needs to be challenged. Uh, it's shameful that the British government is trying to block the genocide amendment to the trade bill, which would uh, simply uh, trigger a review uh, of whether or not the UK should be doing um, trade deals with genocidal states. Um, Hong Kong, where we've got clear breaches of uh, international law. Uh, and of course, the worrying uh, saber rattling that's happening in the South China Sea. Now, again, of course, the current government's credibility is severely undermined when it comes to issues around international law, because of course, Government ministers are on the record as being committed to breaking international law in the context of Brexit and the Northern Ireland Protocol. So again, you know, foreign policy begins at home and we've got to be robust and strong and uh, close down the accusations of hypocrisy. And that really is a challenge that this government has to deal with, um, because otherwise, you know, the credibility of the integrated review is um, uh, fatally undermined. Uh, and then that third C is, is cooperation. Uh, vital in the area we're talking about today, but also particularly in areas like uh, dealing with global pandemics as they emerge. And I, I would argue that if your end goal is better cooperation, the more robust you are in terms of competition and the more robust you are in terms of challenge, the better you will get to, the, the, the better your chances of getting to good outcomes in uh, the, the cooperation side of it and, and I, I, I absolutely agree that we mustn't allow um, what we need to achieve in terms of climate action to become an excuse for going soft in the other areas of our engagement uh, with China. So that for me would be the broad strategic framework that we need for the, the diplomacy and for, if you like, answering the exam question that we're dealing with today. And, and then I think there's some, some opportunities uh, Isabel mentioned the Belt and Road Initiative, and I, I absolutely agree with the, the concerns there that it's potentially a, a climate disaster. It's used, I think, as an, an escape valve uh, for overcapacity, for shrinking domestic markets. It's uh, coal intensive, it's cement intensive. Uh, these are making serious contributions to, um, to global warming. Um, we're seeing the oil sector receiving big loans through the Belt and Road Initiative. So is there an opportunity there? And, and Isabel and I have discussed this in the past. I think I'm actually um, shamelessly stealing an idea that Isabel has put forward on many occasions. But, you know, there's, there's great expertise in the City of London around green investment capital. 
uh, could we and should we be offering to assist in the greening of the Belt and Road Initiative? Not in any patronizing way. The uh, Chinese have tremendous expertise themselves in this area, but anything which can catalyze um, the need to, 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 to mitigate the impact of the Belt and Road Initiative. And, and that's somewhere where some, something where I think uh, British expertise could really brought to bear. So that would be my sort of concluding remark, really, that there are opportunities to make some specific um, uh, approaches uh, that I think could help to uh, show that we are genuinely committed to being a constructive partner uh, to Beijing, but that has to be within the framework of taking a robust position on some of the very troubling uh, human rights and international law issues that we're seeing, and also being uh, very clear that we need to reduce our strategic dependence. And the final area, of course, which has been mentioned is around alliance building. And I'm very troubled by the fact that the last five to six years, the United Kingdom has gained a reputation as an alliance breaker at the very time where we more than anything need to be an alliance maker. Uh, and uh, until we've sorted out this increasingly antagonistic relationship with the European Union, it is, it is going to be difficult to uh, pitch ourselves as global Britain brokering alliances around the world. You know, geography is destiny. And, uh, and we, whilst I, of course, welcome the need for more engagement in the Indo-Pacific and the Indo-Pacific tilt, there's no doubt that we can have far more geostrategic and geopolitical Im impact as a country in terms of building those alliances with our, um, our partners and allies. And the European Union has to be at the top of that list. Thank you very much, Sean, and look forward to questions. Great, thanks. Well, you anticipated my last question, which was to, to pick up Isabel's point that actually most of the influence will come from the EU and, and the US as the other great power blocks. I, I take it you then you agree that a lot of our attention should be on how to influence our close neighbours in the European Union rather than just a bilateral relationship. That seems to be the implication of your last point. Yes, I do. And, and in order to achieve an effective tilt to the Indo-Pacific, OK, if that's a strategic objective within the, within the integrated review, again, we're back to this question of how. And sending an aircraft carrier to the region and being able to perhaps participate in some multilateral trade deals, CPTPP and, and others, it's, it's going to, I think, be registered in the region as constructive but frankly we're not in that neighborhood and as I say I'm sorry it's a bit of a cliche but geography is destiny when it comes to uh, foreign policy and and let you know we just need to be far more realistic about the need for the priority be to be to rebuild the bridges that we've burned over the last five or six years and and uh, to see the re-engagement with the European Union as a stepping stone toward, you know, I work, global Britain is a very nice slogan and I don't think we've got any problem with that, but, you know, we are a European country and that has to be the first building block towards this goal of global Britain strategy. Great, thanks Stephen. I'm going to turn to Sam in a moment for questions, but Isabel, can I just ask one, one question about the, um, the, the, the kind of connection, as it were, between uh, China's authoritarianism and its environmentalism uh, and, and get your take on whether if, if the Chinese government wanted to kind of uh, click its fingers and sort, sort these things out, it can do so in a way that democratic countries can't because it has, has the levers of power it, under its command, both domestically and in the Belt and Road. Yes, one does, you hear this quite a lot, but I, I think it, 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 the, the idea that, that uh, the Communist Party leadership can click its fingers and, and magic happens is rooted in the misperception that there are no politics in China. There are politics in China. They just all happen inside the party. So China is in constant negotiation. The party is in constant negotiation with itself, with, with provincial interests, with big industrial conglomerates you know, the politics of running a large and complicated country. And sometimes, and but not, not infrequently, Beijing has pulled a lever and, and it sort of comes off in its hand, you know, and, you know, 
provincial authorities go merrily on their way. Um, even central uh, central units of government, uh, like the National Energy Administration, which came under severe criticism for the first time um, just a few weeks ago, with a report on essentially how the NEA was undermining, you know, progress towards green. You know, it shows you that that you know politics are politics, and and as I say, simply because they're less visible and less readable in China, um, it doesn't. Mean they don't exist. And I would look, for example, at the questions of, I mean, this is a regime that is very concerned with security for lots of good reasons and some bad reasons. It's concerned with security of, of domestic stability, um, you know, suppressing discontent, nipping problems in the bud before they happen. And that feeds into its climate policy um, in in the sense that there are an awful lot of jobs which are tied up with coal. There are a lot of big economic interests that are tied up with coal. You mentioned the external, you know, the, the building of new coal-fired power plants along the Belt and Road. That's partly, you know, a, an, an, an excess capacity being diverted outwards rather than being closed down inwards. The other security question that affects China's environmental and climate policy is the geopolitical environment. I'm sure you're all aware that China is the world's biggest user of coal and that coal is at the center of its, you know, its emissions. Um, and that's largely because China, China did have some oil, but it became a net importer of oil in the 90s. It's exhausted its own reserves. It doesn't have any gas to speak of. What it does have is coal. So it's industrial revolution, that huge kind of wave of growth that, that began in the sort of mid 90s um, through to what, five years ago, was fueled by coal, which cancels the fact that em emissions doubled in just 10 years, the first decade of this century. So if you are, just as an imaginative exercise, if you are a planner in China thinking about energy security, which is a core part of national security, you are acutely aware that, that key important parts of your energy, probably most of it, comes from outside. So all your oil and gas is imported. Um, and you look at how it's imported and where it comes from, and you realize how vulnerable you are. So there is the whole question of the Malacca Straits, that great choke point, and you know, through which so much of global trade flows, where that somehow to be disrupted by a, a live fire dispute, you would have a problem. Uh, you have uh, an oil and gas pipeline that comes across Myanmar. Oh, well, yeah, not so stable after all. You have a gas pipeline from Russia. Again, you know, that relationship has been tricky in the past, could be tricky again. And you have CPEC, the, the corridor with the energy corridor with Pakistan. Um, and we, again, that goes through Balochistan. You know, is Pakistan a, really a, a stable? It's, it's a close ally, but is it a stable polity? So everywhere you look, if you are a security planner and trained to think of the what if, the worst case scenario, you think, hmm, you know, there are a lot of vulnerabilities here. Better hang on to our coal capacity, even if we're going to underuse it, even if it's going to make a loss, because there's a, a big element of security here. And the worse the geostrategic tensions get, the louder those voices are. In, in policy discussions in Beijing. So when we look at the 14th plan and we see to our disappointment that coal is still in there, despite many voices in China arguing that it shouldn't be, I think that's something we have to remember. Thanks, Isabel. Uh, Sam, I'm gonna turn to the questions. I'll come back to um, Benice and Stephen. Sam, what's, what's the, the top question you want to ask? Hi uh, everyone, so lots of questions, um, sort of in two main areas, what's China going to do next and the specific policy areas that the UK can can push on. So if we start with um, one potentially for Benice, is, is China going to look to replicate its po politics of generosity over vaccines, for example, to Latin America with green tech and innovation, and can the UK respond? Thanks Benice, you take, take that, yeah. Would you like me to take that? So I think that, first of all, let me start by saying that there is a big question about what is going to happen to the gen policy of generosity in the context of post-COVID post -COVID challenges and in the context as well of, 
of generally the aid pot generally being a little bit more squeezed around the world, including in in the UK as well. So I think that I think that what is becoming clear is that with China's net zero commitment, and this actually goes back to answering the question around the BRI a little bit as well, which is that with China's net zero commitment, the question is whether or not some of the loans that it has been making along the Belt and Road on high carbon projects will continue on the basis that it is no longer necessarily as consistent with what it needed to achieve. There were, uh, you might have seen in the news last couple of weeks about, there was a rumor around how in Bangladesh, particularly the official is suggesting that there is now, there is now a directive possibly, or an interpretation of directive from central government that coal has to be reduced or coal investment have to be reduced in the context of the net zero commitment. Now, this is yet to be seen, whether it's true or not, don't get me wrong. But nonetheless, a signaling is suggesting that a combination of these high level signals from the skipper, in this case, the president, Xi Jinping, but also the fact that the economics of coal in general, as Isabel intimated in some ways, is changing despite the fact that it is a major national security consideration and self-sufficiency consideration, may actually create a very different set of policies of generosity around the world. And that will include potentially reducing some of the high carbon project sizes that we've seen so far and changing the profile of some of the BRI projects. And possibly that would indeed be about increasing some of the green technology investment. And last year, in fact, if you look at the numbers, the investments in renewables exceeded that for the first time for that of, uh, that of fossil projects along the BRI for the first time last year. So in that sense, I think the question is, yes, this is this is possibly a trend. And the question then is given what Stephen said as well, and Isabel said about the green finance being potentially an area where the UK has a lot to contribute, not least because of our City of London prowess, is indeed an area where one can figure out whether or not there will be more attractive packages overall that the UK can offer with others in terms of help facilitate also as obviously chair of G7 and, G and COP26 as a facilitator of a large assertive green transition through obviously using the money we have, in fact, less money than we have today, all of us more wisely and more targetly. Thank you. Thanks, but, but um, Isabel, do you want to pick that up quickly and then I'll ask um, Sam to come back with another one? Um, just just quickly on the on the on coal in the Belt and Road. Bernice is absolutely right that the post post pandemic world is going to look very different in terms of um, both of, of how much investment China has uh, in terms of host countries willingness to take on projects. You know, the Belt and Road is, is pretty much faltering right now because host countries are realizing that many of the projects that they that are either in the pipeline or they signed up to don't produce the revenues that were promised and they're left with debt. So there, is, there are high levels of debt, a much more careful scrutiny and a growing realization that, that coal is a bit of a loser. So we've seen cancellations of coal projects, Chinese backed coal projects, uh, la I mean, in the, in the last 12 months in Kenya, Pakistan, Bangladesh, and I think Vietnam. Vietnam. So, you know, the host countries are, are beginning to realize that this is a hiding to nothing, that essentially, if you're building stranded assets, you know, what, why is this helpful? So one of the big things that China could do and hugely important in terms of its soft power. And, and the UK, again, could exert some diplomatic influence here, is as a responsible uh, aid giver and as a responsible development actor to help countries develop the kind of resilience in their grid and the, tech and the management of renewables on a grid, which is in many ways one of the obstacles uh, to developing 21st century energy projects in countries that need energy. China has expertise. We all have, I guess, some level of expertise in managing renewables on the grid, but often developing countries simply don't have that. So if China on the Belt and Road were to put its energy and investment into selling its renewables and to helping uh, host countries manage uh, renewables on the grid, that would be uh, that would be one of those win-win-wins that, that we're all talking about, but which seems so hard to achieve. And that goes also, it ties into what Stephen and Bernice were saying about investments, that if we can agree and if China can be part of an agreement on a taxonomy of green investments, which absolutely rules out 
coal and which directs the money into developing resilient renewables grids in developing economies. Again, it's a win-win-win. Thanks, Isabel. One sentence, Bernice, and then I want to go on to more questions. I was going to say that I completely agree with this, what Isabel just said. We're a bit boring. We're agreeing a lot. But nonetheless, but I also think that this is actually an area that UK and China can work together more, which is the technical cooperation. There are lots of engineers in China, tongues here in the UK as well. I think the state grid in China and the national grid in the UK can have a very interesting technical discussion around how do you do exactly what Isabel talks about, which is phase out coal and bring in more renewable on grid. And that is an area where historically there's a lot of collaboration between UK and Chinese institutions, universities, technical agencies. And I think this could continue indeed in terms of setting examples of what does a carbon free, fossil free power sector look like. So this is both a bilateral as well as collaborating in third country kind of opportunity. Thank you. Great. Thanks. Uh, Sam? Uh, perhaps one for Stephen, given uh, your relationship with the steel industry in your constituency. Um, so should we be looking at human rights in green supply chains? Um, and will queasiness about China's human rights, for example, the majority of polysilicon comes from Xinjiang, uh, spur green onshoring in the UK? Pressing the wrong buttons there. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I think what, is really important is to not draw a false conclusion that by um, taking a more robust position on uh, human rights issues, that will somehow undermine our ability to engage constructively on uh, climate change and biodiversity. I, I think that, that that is not the right conclusion to draw. And in fact, I think the opposite is true. It may well seem counterintuitive, but I actually think that a lot of successful diplomacy is counterintuitive. And it is when you take a robust stance that you uh, you build a better uh, position in terms of uh, having that constructive engagement. So I think the, as the questioner, I think used the term queasiness around what's happening in Xinjiang is an issue that needs to be dealt with it on our on its own terms and that what is happening in terms of investment in green technology and, and reshoring uh, here is something that we may well wish to do and and in my opinion should do because we you know one of the biggest challenges our country faces is the almost total collapse in manufacturing that we've seen since the 1970s uh, i represent a, a constituency with the biggest steelworks in the country and um, you know it's a, it's tragic to see that the steel for uh, wind turbines is manufactured in continental Europe and not here on our own doorstep so the the onshore and offshore wind turbines uh, that we see all over the United Kingdom there is not a ton not a single ton of British steel in those structures and to me that seems crazy not just in terms of a total absence of an industrial strategy here that would be providing good, well-paid, skilled jobs, but also in terms of the carbon footprint, the book is by definition, the more that you're importing of this nature, the bigger your carbon footprint becomes. Uh, and that I, is a logic that I think we should apply, not just because it's good for, from a geopolitical point of view to reduce our dependence on China, but it is also good because it's about creating jobs and, and building a more resilient British economy. I mean. It's uh, where global Britain and levelling up intersect. Uh, and and that's, that's exactly the kind of win-win that we should be looking for. So my, my hope is that, uh, that finally, if, if we're moving out of the utterly failed golden era strategy, which was so naive and complacent, uh, if we are going to take this more robust position and try and become more competitive in terms of manufacturing and particularly the green industrial revolution, if China, if, if China policy has been a useful catalyst to getting a better British industrial policy, uh, then I'm all for it. And particularly if that's also going to contrib contribute to reducing our carbon footprint. Thanks, Stephen. Uh, Sam, perhaps time for one more really quick one. And then I want to ask each panelist a very a sort of one sentence closing question. So, Sam. Yeah, so very quickly, um, 
uh, on another policy area and a couple of questions around carbon border adjustment mechanisms and whether China is baked in as a competitor to that or how can we bring China in uh, to make it more effective? So I don't know, uh, that's a hell of a big question. Um, uh, I, who, who wants to, to uh, but Bernice, so uh, this is your final question, a really quick answer, if you can just sort of say, is there a real danger if, if we do start imposing carbon border adjustment mechanisms of, of a kind of antagonism with China, or is this the way to go? You know, so at the moment, what is interesting is that the reaction from China, in my view, is knee-jerk, which is that it doesn't like the idea that it is potentially green protectionism. But as we know, the reality, when it comes down to it, is that any border carbon adjustment would only work if it is environmentally sound. And that actually, you know, and, and, all, and all the case law in the WTO would suggest that the only way this could work if it is actually embracing environmental integrity, which means that it may not actually make any protectionist happy anyways. This means that even though at the moment the reaction is knee-jerk, I believe that it could be a point of discussion because ultimately when it comes down to it, we're talking about a limited number of sectors of high, high car, carbon intensive, highly traded sectors. And those are increasingly not the kind of things that China necessarily want to export anyways down the line to the rest of the world. So I think that it could be a point of, of beginning of a conversation, even though the knee jerk will be negative. And I think there is no question about that. But nonetheless, that there is something to play for in terms of a conversation. I'm not entirely sure we have enough time before COP26 to resolve that one. But nonetheless, in the medium term, it's definitely something that I think one can build towards having a more global conversation about how to make this instrument a useful and, and, and workable one to promote global climate action. Great, thank you, Bernie. So St Stephen, last question for you. Um, if you, uh, you know, next time you have a, um, a private, quiet, off the record chat with the prime minister, what <laughs> kind of advice you're going to give him? <laughs> Uh, well, I would tell him if, if that conversation could happen today, I'd be telling him to call off the whips in terms of the arm twisting that's been going on around the genocide amendment to the trade bill. Uh, I think it's just uh, absolutely extraordinary what we've seen there in terms of the government's repeated attempts to prevent that from happening. And then my more strategic point would be to to have a strategy, please, because there is so a, such a desperate need to have a situation where the right hand in Whitehall actually knows what the left hand is doing. And this relationship cuts across everything from our university education systems to our uh, industrial policy, to Ministry of Defense, to issues around uh, elite capture and the need to strengthen our defenses there around investment in the UK economy. So we need a holistic whole of government China strategy and the sooner the, the government brings that forward, the better. Great, thank you. And, and um, Isabel, last, the last uh, question for you is, is <laughs> really interested in the answer to this. Is there any way of reviving the, the, the kind of COP15 biodiversity agenda or is that just, because there was a real hope that COP26 and COP15, the two presidencies would work together, we'd get a real sense of a twin crisis. You can't solve the one without the other. It doesn't seem to be happening. Is there any way we can lift the Kunming COP? Well, time, time is short. Um, slightly the Irish question of, you know, if I was heading there, I wouldn't start from here, but we actually don't have a firm date yet for COP15. It's, it's, I think, not going to be made. It's going to be postponed again till just before COP26. So I think there is time. I mean, there are some clear things that Britain could do. China is going to showcase its um, nature reserve policy inside China, the kind of land-based conservation policy. It's extremely silent on marine health. Um, and there is one obvious hit that uh, would actually do a lot of good both for marine health, health and China's reputation and that's um, the, uh, the long promised but never enacted abolition of harmful fossil fuel subsidies, particularly in terms of subsidizing fuel for China's um, global fishing fleet, which is the largest in the world and is responsible for a great deal of degradation of the marine environment. Um, Britain is also, you know, has an interest in, in maritime, in marine health, in ocean health, and quite a lot of 
argument, quite a lot of you know standing in that in that regard. Um, I think China could make some very important concessions on things like that. You know, G twenty has been promising this for what fifteen years, and it hasn't happened. And China is one of the resistors. You know, there is a big win there, both for the planet and the climate, and biodiversity, and for China's global reputation. Great, thank you. I'm I, I wish we had more time. We're going to have to wrap it up now. I see in the chat, Andrew Ledwood from DEFRA has said that COP15 is now in October, so there's a definite date. I should uh, say to Stephen, in terms of the genocide amendment, if Parliament gave itself control over uh, trade deals that other parliaments have, you wouldn't need a genocide amendment. And that's something that uh, I hope uh, Parliament will agree to do. It's been a long standing Green UK aim. But uh, Thanks everybody very much indeed for attending, uh, for, for coming. Thanks so much to the panelists for fascinating answers. And we will be putting this uh, debate on our YouTube channel, the Green Alliance YouTube channel uh, later today. So without further ado, thanks very much and uh, have a good afternoon.